Welcome back to the Demystify Sci Podcast. I'm Michael Shiloh. I'm Anastasia. Today we have Beatrice Villarreal from Stockholm University. Beatrice founded one of my favorite projects in all of astrophysics, which is called VASCO, which stands for... Vanishing and Appearing Sources During a Century of Observations Project. They're looking at missing stars across decades of observational history. And while the interpretation of what that means is completely up for grabs, there does appear to be some interesting objects that were observed and then not observed. And there's objects that weren't there and then appeared all of a sudden, and everything in between. So, of course, this opens a whole can of worms about what the heck is going on in the sky, what is going on with the story of the lives and deaths of stars, but also how does intelligent life figure into some of these observations, potentially. And Dr. Villarreal is very much involved in the SETI project and in the Galileo project and in this search for signatures of intelligent life. We explored all of this so much more. Also, we're really trying to make sense of what is the best sort of institution to tackle these kind of questions because it seems like the existing institutions have narrowed their operations down to these very focused, sharpened points that often ignore holes in the observational windows that maybe are best suited to independent organizations, like the one that we're hopefully going to build one day, where we're able to actually give grants for ideas that don't fit inside of those funding schemes. And so it's a wide-ranging conversation. We covered all of this and more. And she is just a real delight to talk to, a real polymath. She's a musician, an artist. She is developing new experiments all the time. You can tell that she just really loves doing science. And I think that's kind of rare and awesome. Yeah, I definitely agree. It was Dr. Villarreal was a rare example of someone who does science that is really fanciful. Like I'm always talking about playful science and I'm always talking about finding more space in the kinds of ideas that we pursue for projects that go beyond what is expected. And we talk a lot about the the fact that she went back and instead of depending exclusively on modern data, she was like, well, hey, look, if we go back farther in time, if we go back to before there were satellites, there's a lot of things that we can discover without having to collect necessarily a ton of brand new data because we already have pictures that have been collected that we can compare against. And it's that kind of it's that kind of thinking and that kind of inspiration that makes science so exciting. It's where you find new things and Dr. Vera Royale has definitely found new things and she's she's cautious and responsible in how she speculates about what it means. And what I love is that instead of basically deciding that this is going to be the thing that she does from here on out, she's like, no, this is cool and we'll keep rolling on it, but there's a ton of other ideas that are worth pursuing and that I'm interested in. And so I'm going to keep going. And hopefully this is the beginning of a long friendship where we can catch up with her down the line and see what's going on. So if you like the conversation, let us know. She'll be back. We'll ask her other questions. Tell your friends. And if you've already done all of that and you want to support us even more, consider joining our Patreon. Uh, Right now, all the money that you donate goes towards improving our setup. If you'll notice during this interview, we have two new cameras, and so you actually whoop, whoop. get close-up shots of our weird expressions and all of our our micro strangenesses that we do with our face. Um, we have other things that we want to be able to do in the studio. We want to be able to travel. We want to be able to do live shows. We want to increase the quality of the podcast so that instead of getting, you know, just kind of crummy Zoom audio, we actually have really, really high-quality stuff that you enjoy listening to not just on the theoretical ideas level but also on the production level because i think that that's important if you're going to give us all of this time and all of this attention we want to make sure that we're giving you the absolute tastiest thing that we possibly can and once we've lifted that quality to as high as it can get 
we have we want to be able to start giving grants and so whatever whatever bread you can throw our way will go into making a bigger stronger better future yeah and if you come hang out on our discord or become a patron you can start suggesting guests help us really tailor this show to something that suits all of your interests right we really want this to be a community project at the end of the day and so there's a number of ways that you can get involved and talk to us and let us know what we're doing right what we're doing wrong how we can do it better and what topics are cool what aren't and we'll go there that's what we're doing so enjoy the conversation with dr beatrice Villarreal, and we will see you next week the scientific revolution starts now Um, so when I was a um, grad student, or maybe I wasn't even an undergraduate student, I don't remember exactly when it was, I uh, used to do some writing, some creative writing, and one day I was just hit by the thought, like, can an object, a star or anything else ever, can it vanish just like that? And that was a question I got like very obsessed with. However, I didn't have the tools how to work with it at that moment. And um, later in my final year of PhD uh, studies, I realized that it's possible to do it if you use these catalogs and those catalogs. And you can actually compare this US uh, Naval Observatory catalog from 1950s with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So I tried doing that uh, manually. But this was, I could only use like 1% of the data. And then it turned out that it was a huge work because there were like hundreds of thousands of objects, images that had to be watched through with the eyes. And that is what gave birth to Vasco. And so you were just, were you counting these things by hand or? uh, Well, at that time, it was me and two bachelor students who tried to look through a lot of uh, images, but we uh, used a system in the SDSS where you could look at like 25 at the same time and then you, we could fast scroll through. However, I think we missed quite a lot with that method and later when we did it in, um, in our 2020 paper, we already were much more precise with how images were compared. So you, did you, so you developed an, an algorithm that was like put some threshold brightness on these things and then counted them as objects or something? Uh, or? No, we, we, we cross-matched catalogs. And, mm. where, and the objects existed and then if um, the objects in the 1950s didn't exist in a new catalog we needed to to, to check uh, the images like was there something uh, in the new catalog or not and in many cases there was an object in the new catalog it's just that for whatever reason uh, it wasn't recognized like an object but then in some cases there wasn't anything and then you needed to know why is there nothing and then you look at the old images, and very often there were nothing in the both of <laughs> in neither mm-hmm. the old, neither Yeah, neither. Get, but is there is that an automated process by some sense? Like, is it is there a threshold brightness that considers an hand. object? We were just by hand, hand. Uh, in wow. that time, 2016. Wow. And then uh, since then, we have of course developed methods. We now have a citizen science project, but also we have actually developed these automated methods. And that use different threshold limits and a lot of different parameters in order to search for vanishing objects. Mm, but, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I want to hear about the cit- the citizen science arm is new from what I understand. But I I kind of want to did did you answer your question sufficiently for yourself? Did that I that burning question. question. <laughs> oh, you mentioned that you were just uh, you were involved in creative writing earlier in life, and and you had this question of what. Is it possible for a star to just vanish? Yes. Um, yeah, that was basically what uh, got Vasco rolling, that question. Um, and then, of course, the big quest has been to actually search for a star that vanishes and see if, if they exist. And have you satisfied yourself that these 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 image comparisons have proved that stars do indeed vanish or are you still they don't Uh, what we found were a lot of candidates um, but when we have been inspecting them more uh, it turns out that you see something that looks like a star in an old image and then you never see it again 
However, it seems to have been that you had some kind of transient in his bright face in the old, old images. And then it vanishes again. So it doesn't mean that the star actually vanished. It just means that something flared up, got caught on the old images, and later you don't see them again. And when it comes to a vanishing star, like where you actually would see a star in several old images and then they would vanish, we haven't found anything, nothing like that. And uh, there we set a limit to that it's probably less frequent than one in 600 million in uh, Milky Way. However, we found lots of transients, these um, like brightenings in the old images, which sometimes has been translated like vanishing stars. And I'm always trying to correct it <laughs> like in the, in the media and in the popular uh, articles and so on. And so what it re so what the what you're saying is that in the old data from the 50s there was a, a momentary increase in the brightness of the object that you can now see much dimmer in contemporary photos. Exactly, or we don't see it at all in the contemporary photos. So if you can't see it at all in the contemporary photos, why are you not so why do you still have low confidence that it isn't a vanishing star? Because if it, if I would call it like a vanishing star, then I would think of it like um, the object was there maybe for hundreds of years and then it vanished. However, what if, if a star would, for example, brighten up for, let's say, one hour, and maybe it's the brightening we caught on the image, and then it would again maybe get a lot fainter and then you wouldn't see it again so it, even if it would look like a vanishing star it wouldn't actually be a vanishing star but it's more like you would see a brightening star in the old images that now return to its normal so, so basically you just need to watch the things longer in order to and even it seems like how long can you there's no threshold to how long you'd have to watch something to you can never really prove that it's a vanishing star i guess because you could always it could always flare back up again right well i think you can prove that something was a star that vanished if you really see that the star existed in more than one image but when you only have one image where it exists mm. where you see the point then it can be anything it could even be some kind of optical afterglow of a gamma ray burst or or something um so do you see do you see the Vasco project as being like a stepping stone to something to another project that's fifty years from now? Um, oh, that's a beautiful thought. I really like that. Yeah, like, imagine if one in fifty years would actually use the old data and one would use the data from today, and then also add the new data. Maybe one would see some kind of recurrence. Maybe some of these things that were there in the 1950s and later vanished would occur again. And that would be incredibly cool. That I would mean, be just magical. That, oh, that's the crazy thing about astrophysics, right? Is that I feel like our observational window is so short and so recent that our sense for the historic arc of things that happen slowly is, is almost non-existent. Like, because any time that you talk about reconstructing what the life cycle of a star looks like or just all of these astrophysical processes what you have is you have a lot of photographs that are taken of astronomical objects and then they're kind of like retroactively put into a, a movie where they're like okay well this thing that we see over here must be frame one this thing over here must be frame two three four and onwards but it's not like you have a continuous window of observation for the object where you're like okay this is the one object going from frame one to frame 100 you don't have a movie basically that, that's a very simple yeah. way of saying that <laughs> yeah. like, exactly it's like you say and so do you I, I, are there a lot of projects that are happening right now where people are trying to kind of address that and deal with it or is it mostly just Actually, kind no. of my impression is that we, like with the Vasco project, we were one of extremely few projects that were interested to look at astronomy uh, on a long, on a longer time scale. Because of course, seventy years or hundred years is nothing from the point of view of the universe. And still, I felt that 
uh, it was worth a try because imagine if you have some kind of effect that only happen in the Milky Way once every 200 years and you try to look for this effect and if you only use the data taken on during five years of time you're not going to have a big chance to see it however if you use the data during these hundred years maybe you will you will have a chance to catch it and I think a lot in astronomy might be built on that one always wants to build like very great, much better equipment, much better instruments. But this, um, but the perspective on using uh, data that was there 100 years ago is not so exciting because people always want the best of the instrumentation you can have. And 100 years ago, there wasn't um, this beautiful um observational equipment that we have today so it's like they don't trust it because it's old or something like that yeah something well, like that it's 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 probably partially that but it's also probably partially that people just it's hard like you know you go into i i did a lot of microbiology for my phd and you'd sometimes have to go into an old paper that was doing like really basic gene research and it's just, it's hard to read, it's hard to parse, it's not presented, the, the data is not presented to you in a way that you're used to it being presented. There's like, it's almost like a step of Rosetta Stone decoding that you have to go through in order to even be able to parse the information. Because if you have a star map, like, or if you have a picture of the sky, what's the what's the, like the zoom length and the location in the sky and how do you find the exact same place that that photo was taken in order to then compare a modern photo with it like i imagine that that alone is hefty and astrophysics is the kind of the weirdest science in that everything is indirect right you don't have a laboratory where you can just go and start trying things out which is it's weird because it doesn't fit into that standard idea of what the scientific method is right it, you could just have light and you have to make this so many interpretations, you know, of, of what each one of these light signals means and how it's being relayed around and what's going on. And th that really makes it an uncertain business, it seems like. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that's also why it's um, so much more challenging to, um, to test certain ideas or even to challenge certain fundamental assumptions because things it, it, the more difficult it is to actually uh, experiment with something i guess the more the subject is going to be prone to some type of religious thinking i mean mm. not just in the idea of religion but in the um dogmatism beliefs like like beliefs, concretized yeah. beliefs yeah exactly do you think that there's a lot of places where where shifts are necessary in astrophysics? Or do you think that it's... So, like, if you were to look at the discipline as, as a whole, this is like a 30,000-foot view question. On balance, are there more things that you're like, that's pretty good and should hold? Or are there more things that you're like, we probably have to change how we think about that? I think mo there's a lot of things that are really good and hold. I would say, but the most interesting are, of course, those that don't, that are that we don't understand. Like dark matter uh, is one of these greatest questions. That uh, and of course that's why there's so much of research effort that goes there because we don't understand what it is, and maybe it even isn't anything uh, of what we think it is. So, uh, and I guess um, the more exciting the question is. Um, no, what I wanted to say was that um, no, I, I retake I retake it from a different direction. Um, we, of course, are going to gravitate towards the things we don't understand because that's the point of the researcher, not to um, repeat the things that we understand well. And I think we do understand a lot of things well in astrophysics, but our point is to explore the poorly understood topics and see what we can learn, what more can we learn. How much more can we expand the uh, human knowledge? Or there are also, of course, some people that are more interested in accuracy of their model. But I will yeah. say, we, 
astronomers do fairly well on a lot of things and maybe they we, we still have some major challenges left do you think that there's room for those spaces where we know a lot to be interrogated as well like our fundamental assumptions about what we know or are those difficult areas to move right if you have like a a new conception of how something fundamental is working. Is there room for that kind of discussion? So to tie it maybe back to the vanishing of stars, like I remember doing like a back of the envelope calculation for like, okay, so let's say that the sun wasn't going to go nova and it was just going to go out. Cold. It would just go cold. It would have to lose a lot of material. And so I did like a back of the envelope calculation for how long that would take. And it's like, I think it was like 30 or 50 billion years. I think it's trillions, yeah. I don't remember. I remember it being in the... A in long like, time. <laughs> I remember it being longer than the age of the universe and being like, okay, that seems... That seems like it makes it much more difficult to go to somebody and be like, hey, a star vanished. Because the first thing that they're going to ask is they're going to be like, well, how? That's longer... Like, for it to just go out is longer than the entire timeline of the universe. Uh, well, a star could also potentially vanish if it uh, goes into a core collapse supernova. Let's say you have um, some some kind of red giant, and uh, very often when they uh, when they die, they em emit a supernova at the same time as they collapse into a black hole or, uh, or a neutron star. But uh, if you have a failed supernova, or a, uh, what happens is that instead of emitting this bright supernova. Um, the failed supernova means that it collapses directly from being this this uh, massive star into a black hole. And then what you see is that there was a star, and suddenly there isn't. And that would be one route. However, wouldn't you expect to see like gravitational changes, though? Like, so if there's a brand new black hole, wouldn't start things start? It has to, like, gravitational waves. It should emit gravitational waves. Um, and people have been looking for those. However, so far, there is not a single example uh, of a really good candidate of uh, a failed supernova where you have a massive star collapsing into a black hole. We hope I to find it for the Vasco project. We hope to really establish it, to find this beautiful, perfect example of the star that is there in 150 images and then vanishes, but we didn't. I think what I think Anastasia was saying was like the reason that no one's even entertaining the idea that stars could just get cold after trillions of years is because the universe is constrained to the age of 14 billion years, right? And sure. so it's like, what if all of a sudden the universe didn't have that birthday anymore? How would that change the way that we would read the data? Because like, I think, so I, I want to tie this to dark matter a little bit where I'm like, okay, so... If it's possible for stars to go cold, that means that it's possible for us to lose track of them because they're basically just these cold metal things that are floating around the universe. And I can imagine that when they're no longer hot and electromagnetically active, they're no longer held in place in the galaxy in the same way. And so they would accumulate like basically like... Uh, like when you go to the beach and there's uh, dead stuff on the tide and as the waves come up to the beach, they leave the dead stuff at the high tide, like the, the seaweeds and the, and the driftwood and stuff like that. Like, isn't it possible that the stuff that's I mean, just to be fair, like, edge, this was proposed, I guess, in the 70s by a Soviet scientist, essentially. Was this Oparin? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oparin kind of wrote this off in a, in a chapter of, of his book. His, he wrote a famous book called Origin of Life and he just sort of tosses out the idea um, it's not like a developed hypothesis or anything. But I'm but just it, like, I, I wonder if that's, I wonder if it's possible because with the James Webb data looking out to the edge of the universe and starting to see fully formed galaxies that are 500 million years old, and I'm like, well, modern life on Earth started 500 million years ago, and you're telling me a galaxy formed in 500 million years? Well, like, that's the thing. The Soviets didn't. They weren't on the Big Bang. Uh, Sure, and so what I'm saying is time, that, like, yeah. you look at astronomy right now at this moment, and you seem like it, it seems possible 
for the age of the universe to double, to triple, to be 10 I, times old? I don't disagree with you. Uh, I think it's very possible that one has done a, a lot of modeling pretty wrongly. And we learn all the time and we have to be humble in this way because uh, things change. And what we think, uh, what, what we very much assume today can in 20 years turn out to be, have been totally wrong. And that's the beauty of it. I, I imagine that there's going to be quite a lot of resistance for every such discovery because people like their pet ideas. They, if you meet someone who has invested, uh, let's say, 40 years into, a pet, in, into their theory and put all their attention into it, developed it and believes that this is totally true, imagine when you, after 40 years, find out that this was completely wrong. Uh, and that's what you deal with. We, we deal with humans, and it's going to always be a challenge, of course. Oh, that's something I I like literally can't imagine that. That's just like, think about that. Like, think about spending your whole life's work on something, and people are just like, no, no that doesn't make sense anymore. It's just, it's hard to imagine the devastation that. Unless you were someone who all along the way made your name as being somebody who was super open-minded and like pursuing interesting paradigms and right because there's like, I mean, like multiple... if, you, if you had your hand in a lot of different pies or something like yeah, that. yeah because there's like there's multiple there's multiple strategies like it's i think of it like an rpg right like you can max out your like wizard healer or you can <laughs> collect <laughs> or you can collect a lot of different characteristics and become a more well-rounded character and that more well-rounded character might be more useful and more beloved than somebody who's like, no, no, this is the drum that I beat. And this is just like what the world looks like. I think it was always very monothematic when I was playing RPGs. I like to <laughs> select a paladin or something like that. Or, and he, he should be good with fire. I, I always liked fire. <laughs> good and choice. Beat, well, beat people very well. And as sorcerers and all those were more boring for me. Yeah, right? And, and I think that that's inherently... Like part of our nature, which is to to find a beat and to stay on it, and to be like this is a this is like a, a vein that I can mine. But I I always wonder about a science of the future where there's more of this playfulness with theories, where instead of being like you're going to make your career on the one theory that is correct, is it possible for somebody to make a a career on just being somebody who's wildly prolific. I would love that. Years. I would love that, but it would require a complete change of system because now we have this system with grants and that you all the time have to prove that your value uh, through publications and citations. And in order to get much of citations, you also then need to uh, have a good network of people who know who you are, travel to conferences, make your work appeal to other people, which means that you need to work on a hot topic and that whatever you do looks interesting to others. It doesn't mean that you have to be right, but it needs to appear valuable to your friends. It's a bit like Facebook-like. So, <laughs> and when your whole career is built on that, and if you cannot get a grant unless you, the, the next grant, uh, unless you um, manage to get all these extra likes or so, then what happens is that I think people, they get very snowed into certain patterns, what works well. This works for me to get uh, successful publications. And then they do that instead of uh, innovate enough. Because I, I can sometimes see some colleagues who have been working on a topic for, let's say, 20 years. And if you look at the topic, the first papers they did as PhD students and 20 years later, it almost is the same topic because it worked for them. It helped them to grow in academia. And I, I think this whole structure would need to be changed to become much more um, open in order for people to be able to express themselves creatively. In yeah, can, can you think of a way to incentivize people to be able to change their minds in midstream and to, to do more risky, prolific uh, explorations? Um, I would love that to happen. Uh, actually, because I, I'm one of these people who gets like, I like moving away from <laughs> moving to different topics. It's fun for me. Um, and I think some kind of job security would help a lot and not these one year short term contracts. And maybe um, that one 
maybe it would be good if you had a like longer uh, contracts every time and maybe less fixation on certain ways of uh, measuring success mm. i guess yeah that is that is a really interesting issue it's it's very strange how the administrations have sort of squeezed out like the principle of tenure applies to very few people at this point almost all of the researchers and all of the teachers are on these really short contracts. We interviewed a guy, uh, Anthony Avini. He was an archaeoastronomer who got his job at Colgate University in 1970. They interviewed him for 10 minutes on the phone. He got the position. Before he even had his PhD. Before he even finished his PhD, and he was there for 50 years. Oh my God, that's so amazing. <laughs> I know. Oh, I amazing. <laughs> it's just unimaginable though right in the world that we live in like i, I don't even know if i'm going to be technically teaching next year right because i don't get a contract until like the spring or something it's outrageous yeah. i just it's hard to imagine the i don't know what it was there just must not have been very many phds i guess i think there's not that i mean there wasn't that many phds and i think about this a lot where it's like i i think that the the academic world is really preoccupied with technology. And I don't know, if is it, is it that way for astrophysics too? Well, um, I do think so. And I think it's too much uh, occupied with uh, like productivity in some way. Because imagine if instead of having people who work 12 hours daily, I do not belong to them, uh, what one would have so that, you know, your day is built on in such a way that you have five hours for work, then you know that you're expected to spend one hour with uh, the arch, one hour with, me with music, one hour with exercise, and all this would be actually a part of your work schedule in order, for, in order to build a, a well-rounded personality and mind. I think that would be so much more productive, actually, in order to like boost science and new ideas rather than to let people work their 16 hours daily. Because th now you create maybe more like a machinery, while if you would have people only spending some hours per day on science and some hours to be creative in other ways, you would actually build minds much more efficiently. Yeah, it's crazy because my experience in the academy, I was always, I'm very much interested in music. I spend hours every day playing music. And I always had to fight for that when I was working inside of labs and stuff, right? I would always have to, I felt like I had to work twice as hard as everybody else so that I could leave early so that I could work on music. And it was weird because I knew people who spent 16 hours in the lab, but they would just be like watching YouTube videos and like, you know, they, there was so much time that they were wasting it, it felt like. And I always, it took me a while to find a mentor who understood what I was doing and supported me on my schedule. But before that, I always felt so bad, right? Because I had things I wanted to do and everybody else seemed to just be fine to just camp out there and that was their life. And they're just, you know, have tell jokes and sit around the water cooler and just so much wasted time because they felt like they had to be present just to be present. It's so bizarre. Um, I, yeah, I totally understand what you mean. I... Uh... I used like when I was a PhD student. I used to practice every morning. Like I was much more um, systematic than I am today. And I, I had this thing of that I always practiced in the morning, and then I came came to the lab, and I was of course not lab, but uh, the department, and I was all, always one of the people who came in the latest uh, during the day. <laughs> and uh, I noticed angry glares from people. <laughs> Yeah, but, it's weird. But it actually worked for me quite well. I think that the more I practice, the more I also do well the science. There is some type of correlation. And when I cannot practice, I usually am not equally productive either. It's It like gives you something too. I feel like when your time is valuable, when you're doing experiments in science and work or writing or anything... If, you, if your time is valuable to you because you have something else to do, then you're forced to really organize what you do with that time once you get there. Like, I would, sh I would figure out what I was going to do on the subway, like, get all of my day planned out, and I would just get into lab, and I would just be, like, going at it, right? Whatever it was. And then, you know, I wouldn't take, like, the big lunch break. I would just, you know, be real fast, get it done, drink some coffee, and then get on with my life. And I don't know, it just doesn't seem like that's rewarded. Like the angry glares thing is weird because it doesn't necessarily come from the boss. It comes from the other people who are spending the 16 hours a day there. 
I think that it has to do at least in part with the execution of a scientific project versus the theory making about what it means. The time that you spend away from a place is time where you can think about it from a distance and you can start to put pieces together in a way where you're like, hold on a second, what if? But if you're just there for 16 hours a day smashing your head against the keyboard in order to be able to to put something out that looks like it's work that you've done, it's not really the same thing as what science is, which is what drove us to it in the first place. Nobody in their right mind that goes into science goes into science because they're like, I want to work at a computer for 16 hours a day. They're like, I want to understand nature. I want to understand how nature works. I want to be, you know, you read the books of the people that have come up with theories and that have have accomplished incredible things in terms of explaining the universe. And you're like, I, I want to be that. And then you show up and there's this, there's this constraint where they're like, who do you think you are? Get in line. Like there's, there's a ladder, there's an arc, there's a pyramid that you have to climb. And at, I think that that's a really devastating experience to have as a grad student because you show up thinking that it's going to be one thing and you discover that it's something very different. And then when you're standing at the edge of grad school, you're looking out and you're like, Man, this is a long time of this continuing. Like, if I keep going at this, this is like a long road of of not a lot of being able to really play and explain, and more of this very like performative work. I think I I, I was very lucky when I was a PhD student. I had a very good supervisor who let me do whatever I wanted to do. <laughs> so, um, which is usually quite fun. Uh, like, I mean, if one does whatever one wants to do, then. And I was allowed to explore things by curiosity. So I was just, if I was curious about something, I went and did it. And if I wanted to try something else, I went and tried something else. And I think, um, but what I suspect happened to some of my of other PhD students that I talked to, not at my department, but uh, at other places that were like less happy, was that. They got some kind of uh, creative burnout in some way that they they somehow exhausted themselves so much that they lost the curiosity and motivation, which is the absolutely worst that can happen. Like usually, if you lose the curiosity or the motivation, then why are you there from the beginning? And maybe that happens if you are very often told that you are not smart, or you are very often told that your ideas don't matter. Or, I mean, when you have seniors who all the time neglect you and belittle you or something like that, then this might be a result. And uh, on the other hand, if you have a supervisor who is supportive or who at least gives you the space that you need to grow, that, then you get a completely different experience. Yeah, we had, we had com- Anastasia and I had completely diametrically different experiences in grad school i my advisor was just like you're describing was very much concerned with making space to play didn't expect any results for you know months and months and months just just said he he was like look if you want to have a real if you want to publish a really high impact paper it's going to cost a lot of money and so we're going to have to spend a lot of money and that means a lot of time because that's essentially what the money goes to for the most part and so go and like and do that but Anastasia ha- was came from more of like this like German factory setting that was like you are a worker in machine and your role is to understand this component of the you know it, it was just maybe yeah I just I don't know I, I think that it's it's been what like five years since we graduated and I'm like finally just starting to remember why I love microbiology And so that's been very satisfying. And so I think that it's like you go into science because you have a love for the topic. And some people get it gets squashed out of them in grad school. And some people are lucky enough that it 
that they're in a good environment. But I think that really what I want to see in the future and what we're trying to do at Demystify Sci is to just create a space where science can be about that kind of curiosity for more people. Because there's so many stories that you hear where people are like, yeah, it's weird. There's ideas that need to change and theories that could stand to be turned over, but the academy is kind of not the place for it, but it's also the only place for it. And so everybody's just kind of at this like weird standstill where they're like, yeah, I don't Well, it's know. the only place that does super high quality work is what I'm starting to understand, right? It's like, but it's also very hard to introduce new foundational ideas. In, and there's like, like you, like we're saying, there's not necessarily an encouraged play space. Yeah. So like, uh, for something like SETI. Yeah. It's, it's, it feels from the outside that it's kind of a place where there, there's more of this foment of ideas and people coming together and trying to do crazy things. Is that, is that an accurate assessment? Um, I would say that it's unfortunately not, the, uh, and that's what I th thought, and it is true to a certain extent, um, until you reach the UAP topic. Okay. And then you will have the SETI astronomers, say, many SETI astronomers, like 90%, saying, no, UAPs cannot be part of SETI. And say, um, why not? No, 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 that we, we will not touch those things. Like, And then uh, you see that there's always some kind of limits for every community and they well for, for the set of people is the UAPs in Whoa, that's is it just because it's not astronomical or something it is I think there is a, the stigma the stigma has been so strong so strong that people simply are biased by it and at the same time of course the UAPs may not have anything to do with uh, with ET but if there is any remote chance that something that moves weirdly on the sky if we for, for a moment assume that these are like real observations, if you see something moving very weirdly on the sky and uh, it cannot be explained by anything we know, I would be quite interested to look into it uh, if there is a single chance that it can be related to ET mm. or an ET spaceship. And where where are they looking for ET? Just in distant, distant places? Well, the most common is uh, Radio SETI where you use the radio telescopes to look for ET. And, um, well, it, 60 years, no results. So Wasn't uh, there like one blip or something? What was it called? Like the bloop or the bleep? No, or that was the, in the ocean. Oh, that was in the ocean. <laughs> yeah. I thought there was one like possible thing that, that came up. It has a name, I swear. I don't know. The wow um, signal? What's that? The wow signal? Yeah, the wow signal, the wow signal. That's right. Well, it never yeah. repeated. If it wasn't reproducible, it stays like a legend. Mm. And legends are nice. They inspire people. I love, I love legends. It's, I mean, what's, uh, in, what's interesting is that it's all light, right? I mean, electromagnetic radiation in general, it's, it's light. It's, it's bizarre that you would become fixated on one band of light at the exclusion of others like but well, i guess what i'm trying to get at is it seems like extraterrestrial objects whatever they are spaceships or planets or whatever they're going to have interesting light signatures across the board right and it seems like a huge part of making sense of uap would be understanding their light signatures um yeah which seems very much in line with the program of SETI, right? It's just a different band, maybe a different wavelength. Well, I think that the Galileo project is doing uh, really amazing things now. And that, and it's, it's led by Dr. Avilov. Uh, and uh, they have a very nice like concept of how they want to study UAPs. And yeah. With a lot of different ways. Yeah, we've had uh, we've had Avi on the show twice. He actually was on just last week, and then uh, we also had uh, Massimo Teodorani. Oh, very nice. And so it's like it it sounds like they're they're really going for like a very robust approach to just mapping, watching, and photographing. Because the thing that people always criticize about UAP projects is like, hey, camera technology has improved significantly since the 40s when we first started seeing UAPs, yeah. why is it that we don't have a sufficiently high-resolution photograph to track with the increase in camera quality? 
Yeah, that's a very good uh, criticism. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a very very good criticism, uh, and uh, well, if to be frank, if someone would show today a picture of a high quality picture of, of a UFO, most of us would probably think that it's faked with an AI. Yeah, is that part of the reason that you think that SETI is reluctant to wade into those waters? Because it's just, like, there's something about studying intelligence that's at a great distance, or looking for extraterrestrials at a great distance, where you're like, they're far away, it's abstract, it's it's very non-terrestrial, and then being like... And radio waves are such a confined search space, right? It's like, yeah, it's very you're, controlled. Um, yeah, you're looking for something very specific. Go ahead. Yeah, well, imagine now, like, um, if it turns out that, yes, UFOs are real and it's aliens and they're here on Earth and people have done millions of reports about it and scientists never listened. I mean, the people who have not been listening for <laughs> the 60 years they've been so <laughs> they are in an uncomfortable situation. Mm. I, so I guess there's a lot of sociology and psychology involved here and less of scientific <laughs> argumentation. I'm so fascinated by that. Like we, cause so the part of what we do here is that we go and we talk to people that have theories outside the Academy yeah. and a lot of well, the, we talk to people who have theories in the Academy too. Yes. So like we talked to, we talked to NASA people, we talked to MIT people, we talked to people that are like very well versed. And then we also go and we find the best people that we can that are outside of the Academy that have theories. And it's, it's really weird because I feel like we sit in a position where I can tell that sometimes the Academy has like an immune reaction against a theory that comes from the outside. Mm -hmm. but And exactly for the reason that you stated, because it comes with this tone of those idiot scientists. They don't know anything. Mm. And I'm like, I wonder if it's possible to, uh, you know, the idea of the like the debt jubilee. Sorry. Where so there's this idea of something called the debt jubilee that they used to have in the like the Roman Empire where everybody's debts would just be abolished. And it would be like clean slate, we're just we're moving on, everything is forgiven. Like I want us to have a uh Well, they did that to prevent revolution essentially. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so like I wonder if it's possible in the academy to have like a theory jubilee where we're basically just everybody like gets together and is like, you know what? How about we just start from scratch? Like, why don't we just put all the theories in a pile and then anonymously we can evaluate them with no pressure and maybe we'll come up with some good ideas. That would be wonderful, I think, in some cases. SETI needs that. What do you think, what uh, what theories would you, would you like to see it going forward in SETI? Or projects. Well, or projects, yeah. Uh, EG probes, absolutely. And such as what EG probes would be a very important thing, in my opinion, and maybe the best way of going forward. Uh, what are those? Um, like, um, we humans, we can send something similar to Voyager 1 very far away. We can send it from very, very far away outside uh, our solar system. Now, imagine another civilization might be able to do the same thing. And they might send thousands or millions of uh, probes to explore other uh, o o other stars and their planets. And uh, I think it would be really, really good to search for these objects. In fact, we started this, um, and um, me and the Vasco team, we started to search for these probes exactly at the same time or like a month before maybe a month before then the Galileo project started. So these things all kind of were timed at the same time. It comes naturally uh, with the progress of the field or lack of progress of the city field. <laughs> and like the new wave of thoughts that were in the society and in how we were doing science. And so I, I'm very much into ET probes. I think this, there's a there's a lot to explore. And if you, in the end, will search for all these ED probes and find absolutely nothing, we also learn something. We learn that they are sufficiently far away from us not to be any danger for us in that way. What are the techniques for, for looking for them? So 
for example, in the Vasco project, we have been looking for uh, solar reflections from such uh, probes by uh, using old photographic plate surveys. So if you have uh, some kind of um, fast solar reflections, if you have a, uh, a probe that is in orbit around the Earth, sometimes you get something that flashes very fast. This could, by the way, be misinterpreted like a vanishing star because you see something, um, a flash in one image and you don't see it later. And then what you can see is like multiple flashes uh, in the old, or you, what you should see if you have a probe is like multiple flashes in the old images. And um, so um, if you would want to search for it today in the sky, you have a small problem. And that's that you have like thousands of satellites and you have a lot of space debris. Uh, that, and it's usually like highly reflective metallic stuff that gives off these fast flashes. And now, so how do you get around that? That's why we use these old photographic plates from pre-Sputnik times. Mm. And so that's one of the techniques you can use. And there are, of course, other techniques also. This, isn't the Oumuamua thing doing this flippy thing? Or there's some evidence of, of this, uh, this multiple reflective surface thing. I, I feel like the original explanation from Avi, the first time we talked to him, was more along the lines of something like a Voyager probe. And now he's considering it maybe a piece of junk from a Dyson sphere or something like that. I mean, I don't expect you yet you to know the details of that, but it seems like that was one of the early explanations was ET probe. Mm -hmm. I like that explanation very well in comparison to the Dyson sphere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you mention it like that, <laughs> yeah, he's really hot on the Dyson sphere lately. It's a, it, it's um. The Di well, first of all, the Dyson sphere opens up so many different questions. Yeah, I don't like Dyson spheres as a as a theoretical construct, even. It's like no, it's yeah. I'm like, look, if a civilization has the technological ability to build a Dyson sphere, do they need the Dyson sphere? Would they put it around a star? I would put it around an AGN or active galactic nucleus. You have much more energy there. Why would I put it around every star in a galaxy? Like some people think. Yeah, like it just. Seems like also like my perspective is just that if the civilization has that level of ability, you would probably see some smaller sh ships or something like something less impressive first, right? Well, it'd be harder to see. Well, they'd have a lot of these little probes out probably in space, and yeah, it I just seems like it's a huge like the the scale of building a Dyson sphere is hard to comprehend. Like it's hard to imagine a civilization that can r shrink wrap a star. I just, it's, it boggles the mind. Well, if they can do that, they probably can also make a star vanish in other ways and they probably can do other <laughs> yeah. things. A lot of things that we can't even imagine today. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I guess it's like, for me, anytime that I start thinking about space, I always run into my lack of understanding for how we, we, conceptualize the distances and the difficulties of actually being able to tell right so it's like for me it's the difference between reading a pop sci article about some astrophysical discovery and then going and looking at the primary data like the the way that the data is presented is in pop sci is so beautiful there are these you know artist illustrations of what the data means and then you go look at the data and it's just a bunch of graphs and it's a bunch of graphs that are the product of these light detection events on. We're lucky if you get graphs. Sometimes it's just tables <laughs> and numbers. It's just and, tables. Or download yeah. the data. Download the data set. <laughs> process it yourself. Learn some Python. And so I guess it's just I have such a poor understanding of the the nuts and bolts of observation and how you make conclusions. Like I like the Vasco study because it's actually photographic plates. Like that to me, I'm like okay it's harder for me to imagine a problem with the model or a problem with my understanding when it's a photographic plate that you're just comparing across two times. But when you start to get into like abstract interpretations of the uh, brightness and dimming of a distant star, it just starts to, I just, I have a hard time conceptualizing it as being Objective? Objective and robust enough for us to say anything with really great confidence beyond there's a star there and it seems like this is the most abundant stuff that's in this star. 
well, that's why I, uh, whenever I try to design a project, I try to make things as clear cut as possible, like in the project design, because I don't like uh, amb like being insecure uh, about like the interpretation too long. I like it to be uh, some either one very clear explanation or some uh, clear cut alternatives that can be tested in one way or another, which of course always doesn't work out. But um, the gray zones I find complicated. And the same thing with techno signatures in the gray zone, because uh, if you have some kind of techno signature, yeah, 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 it could be natural, but yeah, but it also could be something uh, artificial. And now we'd need to do a lot of modeling to figure out if it's natural or artificial. Now. That's that sounds like an entire career right there, though. <laughs> exactly. It's an entire career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes me think of Shabilsky's star, which is just like a... a I love Shabilsky's star. It's, it's so bizarre and strange, but it just throws... Like, it throws... Everybody has a theory for what it is. It's like, there's just no clear-cut answer available. I don't have a theory yet. Aww. <laughs> Are you working on one or it's no. it's something that kind of, okay, all right. Uh. <laughs> I mean, why do you think that it's so, it's, it's so, uh, such an attractant just because it's inexplicable? Well, yeah, it's like either you have to rewrite foundational stuff about how stars work. Because there's heavier stuff in it than should be there? Yeah, there's like really, sh so Shabilsky's star, for people who haven't heard of it, is this bizarre star that seems to have these really transient heavy heavy radioactive elements right these these big elements that we generally think of as being formed only in the aftermath of supernova right because the energies required wouldn't put them inside of a normal star particularly a star that's been around since it'd be like the, a short-lived star and so how are these things happening like are is an alien dumping its junk in the star or is there really fusion reactions or fission reactions happening? Or are there big things being made in the outer layers of the star and we just don't understand it? It's very, very troubling. <laughs> but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I want to go and see. What, uh... we, have, uh, we have some people that are in the patron chat that were asking questions. And um, do you want to ask the first one that we had? Um, somebody just, I, I know you don't have your own theory about it, but some, somebody asked what hypotheses have people come to you with uh, trying to explain these vanishing stars? What are some of the more interesting, um, not that you have to put any stock in them or anything, but what have you, mm. what have you heard? Um, I must admit that I do not remember what like uh, theories people usually approach me with. Mm. I only remember the stuff that has survived because there have been a lot of ideas. People said, oh, could it be that? Could it be this? And the surviving uh, explanations for what we see, where we see something, uh, uh, these bright events in the 1950s that no longer are seen, is that um, when we talk about the single events, um, where you see only one object that is there and later vanishing, then we think it could be that there was a star that flared up in the 1950s, or it might be an optical afterglow to a fast radio burst or a gamma ray burst. And uh, so these are the hypotheses that we have been working with. Um, how, however, we have later found more weird things. And that is like, uh, we found an image where you have nine stars that appear and vanish within half an hour in a small, patch of the sky hmm. and that is where things started getting very fun hmm. and there um i've also got a lot of people coming with different suggestions of what it could be um but that is much more of a difficult challenge to explain and i'm embarrassed to say that i have forgotten a lot of good hypotheses people have so uh, can you say memory. more can you say more about those nine objects that oh, were there and then they vanished? I can't even show you them. I have mm -hmm. somewhere an uh, image. Oh, cool. Great. All right, what do we have here? So in the green circles, you actually see 
nine beautiful stars with typical brightness um, profiles similar to all the other stars. And they are there here in this image on the 12th of April, 1950. Then they are no longer there. They vanish. And they are not there half an hour earlier either. And they're not there six days later nor 30 years later. Mm. And that became like quite a mystery because there's no way you can uh, do that in the 1950s uh, with just some astrophysical uh, pheno phenomena. You, there's no way how you can get that. You could create like uh, short-lived uh, short transients and multiple of them if you have satellites or space debris, but this is 1950. So that is a very like fun problem. So one of the first explanations that we have, of course, have is that there must have been something wrong with the plate. Let's say you have some kind of plate defects or contamination. Now, if you think of the normal plate defects, they are usually not round and they're usually not having uh, a star-like uh, brightness profile. So that's a problem because now we have nine of them that all have star-like uh, brightness profiles. So to get this kind of coincidence nine times in this little image of the sky is kind of problematic. And uh, so then the solution would have been to look at the original plates, but it's super difficult to get access and to travel there because they are, it's like museum materials, so it's a long story there. Um, so what we're doing now is that we are working on a new project where we are going to search for these things in the modern sky in a way that allows us to separate it from uh, satellites to see if this is real or not, this effect with multiple transients. So that's something that is super fun. Could it be I, like I a ball of dust or something? Could it Could it be, no. Nine balls of dust? Nine ball, I don't know, I was just thinking like a ball of dust going by the in-between, I don't know. No, because the other stars are beautiful and equally clear. Mm, fair enough. <sighs> And so, okay, before we move on from it, though, what would it take for you to be convinced that they were stars that went out? Um, I don't think they are stars that went out. I think that there was something that flashed up on the sky very briefly. Something that caused short flashes happening simultaneously, if that thing is real, if the effect we see is real. And what it would need is that I would like to see... I would like to be able to confirm the effect with modern instrumentation and uh, confirm it, separate it from mundane explanations, and that it should be reproducible, that you would see it more, more than one time. I, um, I guess I, what I wonder is about the, the depth of surveying that we have right now. Like, the sky is very, very big. Again, I'm like approaching this from like total Rube perspective. But as far as I understand it, the sky is very big. We have a limited number of telescopes. What percentage of the sky are we surveying with a 30 minute interval? With, with a what? With like a 30 minute interval of just like picture, 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 picture. I do not know how the, um, the answer to that. I think it's just a very small fraction of the sky because it's, you take a picture and then you move, it, you, you move your telescope to a new place and you take a picture and you move your telescope. Of course, there are also these uh, projects that are trying to look at uh, all sky all the time, but then you're usually only seeing the very, very brightest stars. So even if you see the whole sky, you're not going to see to to the same depth, like if you are watching just on one little patch of the sky. So I don't think I can give you a number. Yeah, I, I mean, remember being really shocked just looking at where the like the, some of the big cosmological questions concern the the Hubble telescopes images, these deep field images, right? But I was really surprised, and I can't remember the number either right now, but it's a very tiny fraction of the sky, because the only place you can look is away from the galaxy. So you're limited to this very tiny little portion, essentially. Plus, you're getting so much data, even out of a, a tiny, you know, arc second of sky or something. It's just like gigabytes, I don't know, ter petabytes of data. And so there's a real processing issue there, too. Yeah. yeah. And that and that's, 
Yeah. Is there, how do you, how do you deal with that? Like as, as a scientist who's trying to organize it and structure it and be able to access it easily and robustly. So in the VASCA project, uh, we were dealing with already existing data. So it means that someone else did the dirty work um, when they kind of with the obs- doing observations. And then they did the, um, the, what's called the data treatment, the raw data treatment. And then we got like the nice images already uh, processed. And then uh, um, the thing that has helped me a lot is that I have a very good collaboration with the Spanish Virtual Observatory, where they have super good experience with dealing with huge data sets. So they have uh, all the programs and interfaces, and they have been helping to, like, uh, it wouldn't be possible to do the project without them, if we say so. They, They have all the expertise on these big data sets. However, now with a new Exopro project, we are going to actually take data off the sky, uh, which is going to be a new experience for me in this way of like systematically take data. And there, I think we're going to get enormous amounts of data every night. So that will be fun. What's the we'll uh, see how it works out? So can you tell us about the Exopro project? I don't know it. So, uh, so in the Exopro project, we are actually going to search for probes and also these multiple transient events uh, with a new instrumentation that we have designed. It is so far, um, what is called, confidential, all the details on the design um, because we are, well, so far we cannot share the details of how we're going to do it. Um, But in principle, we're going to use a network of telescope to do the search for these probes. And the idea is that you can, you should be able to uh, verify and validate a probe real time, and also get a spectrum of it, or of so, get a spectrum of any event that you think might be a probe. Do you? So, uh, do, it, do you bump it, up a? Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, no, uh, what I, what we hope is that, like, by doing the approach that we uh, uh, are doing. Uh, you should be able to uh, not only say if there is a probe, but you should be able to get a very, very accurate 3D location in case you want to go and pick it up. Mm. So, Go and pick it up. I like it. The be- aliens are listening. They're not happy about this. <laughs> um, w- you send a PhD student. <laughs> Just like piloting the probe. Um, are you bumping up against like national security stuff when you're doing this? This is the thing that we have designed the project in such a way that we don't disturb them. Mm. Um, because I don't want to be dealing with national security stuff. I don't want to do anything that, that would be like borderline uh, in any way. And that's why I'm staying outside the atmosphere. That's also why I'm not equally excited to look for UAPs. Because when you deal with UAPs, you end up with the national security issues. Mm. Uh, however, if you are outside the atmosphere and if you design a project like we have done that we are not going to have to deal with any national security issues at all that's we a can. really good choice probably <laughs> yeah. we had oh. uh, we had diana pesoka on the show and she was it was kind of sad she would seem like she was leaning towards not even she's done a ton of work on uips and she seemed like she was kind of tired of it for that very reason that some of her friends were like being followed by s- shadowy agents and getting stopped at airports. And she was like, I just want to study stuff that's fun and not have it be so serious. And I don't know, it's just kind of sad that it's come to that. No, but if you look at Vasco, we are looking at uh, images of the sky when there were no satellites and no space debris. So it's not really a national security issue if you would find a satellite because it would be in a country that has sent it up. So it's that, that's the beauty of like looking in the 1950s. You don't, um, you, you simply don't run into those issues of mm. uh, discovering secret human programs. <laughs> yeah, but as the new da- is the, the new data though, right? Uh, it, or is this citizen science project still looking at the old data? Yes, we're going. To, we're going to later update it with the old, new, like new old data. I see. But with new, uh, new questions to look at. In the new project, we have actually also found a solution, which I cannot say. <laughs> um, but the solution gives us a minimum 
a number of false positives and we don't need and no national security issues. So I'm very happy for that. Is there, I've heard a lot of astronomers talk very disparagingly about the sort of the trash heap that is low Earth orbit. Do you know of a lot of, is there is there a good conversation happening about how to clean that up and how to fix that and how to make it less destructive and disturbing to observation? I'm afraid I, I do not have any constructive suggestions about <laughs> Uh, yeah, that seems. It's just. It's. <laughs> I heard a cool idea. It was like a big gummy net or something like that. I, uh, I don't know. I looked into this for a while. How about preventing people from sending a lot of stuff there? Yeah, the I beginning? just. I mean, how far away are we from it just being so full that anything that you send up is just going to come tearing down because it gets hit by something? Like, are we satur? Are we close to saturation? I think you can always send up more crap. Yeah. <laughs> Horrifying. Yeah, I mean, space is big. Space is big. Yeah, yeah, I think it's more just the little tiny pieces that are threatening, right? I, I've seen some of these pictures of, like, pebble-sized impacts to titanium. It's just unbelievable, like, yeah. with regard to the space station or something like that. Hmm. So bizarre. What are, you, what are you really optimistic about in astronomy right now? The project we are doing, the exoprobe and Vasco project, and that makes me very optimistic. It gives me excitement for every day because I'm just wondering, uh, like, I'm wondering, will we be able to confirm this funny effect with a new instrumentation? That's currently everything that is in my mind. I just want to know if yes or no. How soon, how soon are you going to be at the point of taking observations, do you figure? Half year, also. Okay. So, uh, or maybe not. Yeah, half year with uh, the full methodology, I would say. That's really exciting. We'll have to have you back when you start collecting data. That'll be really I'm exciting. so excited about this. This is so incredible fun. So. That's very cool. How will, well, how will it change? How will it change what you're doing if you do actually discover a probe? Sit if we discover it, then we will um, try to do uh, localize it as accurately as possible, and then it will be very, very important to, uh, as early as possible, get engaged with some of these space companies that bring down space debris. Because I, I, re I really would. I'm serious when I say that they would like to bring down the probe to Earth. Yeah. Well, what, if the, what if the aliens aren't happy about that? Though I mean, I would bring it to the ISS <laughs> first. As like a stepping stone, you know, like That's contain it. <laughs> yeah, just go touch it and see if it sets off an alarm or something. Yeah, you right. Know? Just like you like approach it and a light starts blinking. Like I don't know. I'm just like imagining going and taking like a U.S. military drone, like and just being like, "Oh, that'd be cool. I'm gonna just borrow that." <laughs> like I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd have a house to go home to at the end of the yeah. day. You know? oh, Maybe man. it's a trap, and, and once you pick it up, then the aliens know. Okay. There's food Get there. Dinner is served. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like that's, I, and I think that that's why it's so, it's such a crazy edge to be surfing because none of us really know if an alien civilization would be friendly or not. If they're anything like us right now, it seems like they would be hungry, resource extracting. You know, if you have to build a Dyson sphere, you probably need a lot of slaves and a lot of ore. And yeah. a lot of animals die when you plow the fields, you know? Yeah. And so there's just there's a part of me that's like, oh man, somebody that's that advanced is definitely on the on the lookout for raw materials. But, but that actually, yeah, I think there's actually questions like um my ambition poses a serious ethical challenge. <laughs> <laughs> my ambition to bring down the probe should actually encourage other astronomers to say, hey, hey, like, let's think about whether it's a good idea. What do we do if we discover one who will own it? So I think it's it should encourage other astronomers to start thinking because if we succeed, I, I will try. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, there's some, then there's going to be an alien astronomer, you know, light years away who's like, ah, oh, damn it, my probe. You know, it's going to be, <laughs> it's just so funny to imagine both of you sitting on opposite sides of the galaxy. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Oh. I don't know. I mean, it's really cool. It sounds like there's there's a lot to look forward to. It sounds like you're doing really ambitious, cutting edge work that's really refreshing to see. And it, I love how it pops up in the lid of dynamics in observation, astronomical observation, right? The idea that we should be not just looking once, but checking back on the things and really following these regions of the sky. I think that's a really cool dimension. And I, and I always love seeing, you know, there is some of this, right? Like we'll watch supernovas unfold or something like that. But to just be looking at a random piece of the sky and see what's changing, that's, that's a pretty cool approach that I'd like to see more of. Lots of different projects doing that would be really awesome. There are a lot of transient astronomy projects now happening. I think, uh, however, this discovery that we did wouldn't, none of them would be would be able to do it because they're filtering away anything that would look like satellite glints or so, and they have such a contaminated sky. I, I know a lot of astronomers are saying, oh, why are you sitting with these old photographic plates from the 1950s when there is these huge, fantastic surveys we have today? And I'm always thinking, yeah, but in the 1950s, the sky wasn't full of trash. Mm. Yeah. It's a completely different window. So people sometimes underestimate the value of uh, old data. I mm. think they strongly un underestimate it. I, I wonder why you said earlier that you're not that big on constructing theories. And I wonder, is that a philosophical approach that you take in terms of your position in the world as a scientist, or is it just something that you figure that you'll get to later? Um, it's, I like to work, um, I, I like to take observations and try different hypotheses. I, I really like constructing different hypotheses and to test them. I find my enjoyment there. And uh, uh, of course there are exciting a lot of exciting things one can do with like working on building on some theory but my problem is that i'm usually so curious that before i reach to that stage i already ask new questions on not new type of problems and i just never have the time to to work on building it because i simply move and move and move all the time it's like i started with agn as a phd student at agn environments and then I got curious about a new problem. If you look at all my papers, they all the time change. The topic all the time changes. And that's a personality issue, one can say. <laughs> but, but working on a theory takes that you really focus on that particular problem for a long time. And you build it and you nurture it like you nurture a tree. It's uh, and, and I just... Uh, I diverge too fast, I guess, in the direction of where I find new interesting lands. I like I love I love exploring the untouched landscapes in science. Mm. I love that. I think that it's the raw material for theories though. Like I, I, I really want to mm. see a world of science where theories are less something that you spend your entire career working on one, mm. but it's more more part of how science is approached where it's like okay so there's going to be people who are like you where they're constantly curious about something new and so exploring these untouched landscapes putting forth good data being able to to make these comparisons and then the next level is the people who come along and they look not at just at your work but the work of other people who are like you and then connect all these puzzle pieces together and are like hey this might be what it's saying and yeah. have that not be something that they have to stake their whole career on. Right. It's just like, Hey, I think that these things fit together. That would be interesting. They can also fit together like this. And it's like, I always thought it would be interesting. People. Those are so smart. Those people who can do that and do it well. I just, I think that it's not, it's like, it's kind of like the, I don't think that it's necessarily smartness. I think that it's, a kind of creativity that's rarely nurtured. It's like I wasn't as a as a grad student and as a, as a scientist, I was rarely taught to make theories that were bigger than just how does this molecule interact with this protein? Yeah. You're and, right, it's a school thing. 
They dis- they discourage usually these things. They they make you feel like a crackpot if you suggest a big theory. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess maybe I'm. I'm I always thought it'd be interesting it. if the theorization was separated from the observation entirely in and as far as it's being up like the industry is operating right if people were just collecting data and those experiments were submitted and then separate groups of people did all of the work and then even maybe maybe more democratically people in general looked at the data and then came up with theories on it they weren't invested in the experiments themselves like an actual like separation of church and state type situation i don't know just half-baked idea or like a citizen science of theories Mm. but i don't know i mean i i think that one of the cool things about the modern era is that it seems like there's a lot of possibility like there's there's more access to the data there's more access to the ideas there's more access to the platforms where people discuss these things than there really ever has been before and it's a cool time to be alive like i'm i'm glad that i'm born and now and interested in science now rather than 50 or 60 years ago like i think that it would have just been much harder to be a uh, a joy writer through the world of science than it is today. I, th- I think you're totally right about that. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I think 60 years ago, if one was a scientist, one didn't have this enormous... Well, I might be wrong, but I, and maybe someone who is much older than I am should correct me, but uh, I, I suspect that one had more of uh, time to work on a paper, while today there is all this publish and perish pressure which means that we have far too many papers and far too, far too much of uh, noise creation. That's so. hard to argue with, yeah. There's definitely a lot more tenure in, in like positions where you're actually moving in for your whole career. And now and it's like you need to uproot your life all the time uh, every time your, your work finishes. So personal life, family life, or if for those who have it or whatever. So you work somewhere for two years and then you need to move to a new country until because until you get tenure maybe you are being tormented in this way and i don't think it was like that 50 or 60 years ago maybe it was a more human approach yeah i mean that's for sure just i like i think about anthony avini and his 10 minute tenure interview at least once a day (laughs) <laughs> like it just it's a story of a world that's gone and we've been, we've been watching a lot of old movies recently we watched um Zabriskie Point which is this like super weird postmodern movie we watched what was it Civil Law or something I'm terrible with the title it was like a John Travolta movie about some some law we watched my cousin Vinny and so there are the, all these like old movies from before cell phones and there's something just so different about the people in them. And there's something so different about the way the stories are paced and the way that life appears. To, and granted, it's Hollywood, so it's not real life. You mean just like how patient everybody is and just the time that it takes to develop ideas? And- yeah, and even the like the look on people's faces is different. Like the way that people look is completely different. And there's just something that's weird that's happened over the course of the last... 20 or 30 years where it just feels cataclysmic in some way and I feel like we're all in this like we're in a car that's speeding towards something and nobody knows exactly where we're going or why we're going so fast but we keep going faster and everybody's just like can we just stop like can you just take your foot off the accelerator just for a minute and can we go back to like being humans and it it's really that's another thing that we really want to accomplish with this project is that we're crowdfunded and we really yeah. want to be able to start a nonprofit down the road where we take the funds that we get here and start to distribute them to researchers and people that are working on projects so we can be like you know what your work is really great and and worth supporting and we want you to be able to actually stay in one place and just do your work and I think that there's a lot of other people who are working on that as well. Like, we're not the only ones. There's a bunch of organizations that are popping up trying to do the same thing. Because that feels like it's what you need. In order to have a good idea, you have to be relaxed and you have to be able to just 
sink into it. Absolutely, and that's what uh, is not currently being offered in the academic environment, I'm afraid. It's missing. And um, the current academic environment doesn't really give you that time in order to test things. And you also need to have time to be wrong, because many times you start on a route, and I, I guess that many routes are going to be wrong. But if you, if you don't try, you won't discover that. And if you only go on the safe thing and the safe bet, then you don't actually do anything but incremental progress. Yeah, it just seems like it's the perfect time for independent granting organizations to pop up that are interested in filling the holes that the academy can't get to. Because the academy does one thing really good, and like that's fine, it can keep doing that, and the funding structure is whatever. But it be it's. I'm just certain that we're going to start seeing these independent granting organizations pop up. Like we personally know people who are already doing it. We're planning to be doing it. It's just it's going to happen. And it, it seems like the solution is not just to try to make some huge reformation happen in the academy. It's like well, just solve the problem elsewhere and and be a complement to what's already happening. I totally agree. And uh, it would also be good if one had like institutions that are in some ways both academic and non-academic at the mm. same time where people could actually, uh, like they could be affiliated there to do their academic work and they wouldn't have the pressures like the rest of academia. They would be free from all these uh, politics and, and the political structure of academia. Mm. We've run, uh, run up against a couple of those. Have you, have you heard of the Perimeter Institute? Um, I heard of it, but I don't know how it functions or works. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the inner details. It just seems like it's another case of uh, funding ideas that wouldn't necessarily play well inside of the constraints of the academy. But I, yeah, I hope to see more of that. Really, I'm sure well, we will. A very good effort you are doing, and and want to. Oh. Do. I think that's <laughs> very good. So, I mean, so are you. Like, the, the work that you're doing is really cool and aspirational and just, I'm really, really, really excited to see what comes next. It, it was, it's, it's, a, it's a relief to know that you exist. <laughs> Thanks. No, it, it's, um, I'm having a lot of fun. There's a lot of challenges, I, not the least the sociological challenges uh, of conducting the research that I do, but uh, it's super fun. Very cool. It's um, rewarding, I would say. Well, let's catch up again next year and see where you're at and see how things have developed. Very gladly. Excellent. I will be very happy to do it. <laughs> and hey, if people oh, want to oh, find... Before you go, uh, are you still working on music, by the way? <laughs> well, I still do music, yes. I are you? play music. Not, I, I don't practice every day anymore, which is not very good. You sent us some recordings and they were just incredible. Um, do you mind if can we share that? Can we sh do you mind if we share those with people or would you rather us not? Sure, go ahead. All right, all right, cool. They are not, cool. They are not fantastic. I'm just an amateur musician, so it's well, no, but you have you have a really good feel, right? There's a musicality to it that you don't encounter. Um, it's not necessarily like shredding on on. You play the violin. It's the violin, yes, right? The violin. Yeah. It's not like shredding music, but it's very uh, it, it's very tasteful and, and beautiful. It's and, very emotional. Um, it's in very a way emotional, that yeah. like you don't that that I think is is where the joy of music comes from. It's feeling that emotionality. And it's definitely there. It's beautiful. And I think it's really important that people see that that tradition, right? There's all when I read about you know, we're working on our first book right now. I'm going deep into the history uh, of science and reading about these scientists. Man, like, all of them are, like, writing symphonies and stuff. And they're like, these people are multidimensional, right? And I, I really think it's important to, um, I used to, draw to praise you for doing that. I used to draw a lot when I was, like, uh, until I finished high school. And then I stopped. <laughs> hmm. It's like... It, there's so many things one could do if one had time mm. and then at some point it's like the, this, the pressures of society on that you need to be you know focus on one thing and you become more and more narrow there is some type of uh, narrowing that happens over time mm. it's just interesting that the 
the early predecessors, the early scientists didn't experience, I mean, I'm sure they were all just bloody rich to begin with. <laughs> they all seem like barons or something, right? They, they didn't have to work necessarily. Maybe that's all it is. is it they, helps, they, like if you live in an estate, it's easier probably to be like, the servants will take care of dinner and cleaning yeah, and yeah, the fire maybe that's and all it the is. browns and I maybe. will ponder. But I think it really worked for them, right? I think like, sure I mean, I, d I think that that ability to step aside and do something else it, it helps both domains right like when i'm working on science sometimes i'll have musical ideas and if i'm just staring at the music i won't have musical ideas but if i and then vice versa right yeah, yeah. and so i think having all these different dimensions is really healthy and so i just i just wanted to mention that before you took off how, how cool uh, and it is I, actually, that I also connect easier with scientists who also play music mm. there's something about it that it's for me easier to form a connection or uh, understand like mutual understanding and I did notice, by the way, one more thing, that there's a big change in this uh, tradition. Like if you look at those who are um, those who are professors who are now are emeritus, many of them are musicians or artists or painter, I mean, painters, writers. While today, if you look at a normal average graduate school, it's not as common. And yeah, that worries me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, me too. <laughs> the life of a professor does not seem that fun. Like I rem every yeah. we went to Columbia and every single professor I met just seemed perpetually on the verge of a nervous breakdown unless they were emeritus professors. Like the ones that had their Nobel prizes and had been doing their stuff for forever, totally fine, no problem. Anybody that was between the age of 30 and 50 just seemed like they were just white knuckling it especially if they had a family oh my god the combination must be so stressful i just i can't i can't even I, it just it seems unimaginable that they managed to accomplish anything seems that inhumane, yeah. yeah it just it's like but even maybe worse than it being inhumane i don't know that's there it, it just seems counterproductive right it's like, I don't think that there's this integrated understanding that when you take time to, to pursue some creativity or some sport or something, that that actually helps your output. It's like, it's it breaks the minds institutionally to consider that. Yeah. Do you have any closing thoughts? It was really a pleasure to talk to you both. I was very nervous at the beginning. <laughs> <has> been oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad that um, I'm glad you you had a good time and we didn't we didn't hit you with anything that you you didn't really want to talk about or anything like that. Um, we just we just love this stuff too, right? We love all these topics and like I said, uh, the Vasco study has it was literally the first blog I ever wrote. You know, I was just so he, excited he about it. He talks about the Vasco Can you study to me again. Uh, I don't know if you want to read. I don't know if I want anybody to read it. It's so bad now. Oh my gosh! Uh, he really uh. does mention the Vasco study at least once a week. Like it's <laughs> it's, it's it's very in it's very interesting stuff. I think just because it's so different than than what's it's a new kind of study. It's a new way of looking at the cosmos, and I don't know. It's just a, in a some sense, it's a sign of it's a, a proof of life that science is still alive that people are capable of doing new lines of research that haven't been done before and so anyways i really appreciate your oh, work i enjoyed it so much uh, i must say well yeah I'm, I'm, let's just see what happens i'm really really curious to what goes on with this probe and i hope that you'll uh, you'll take me on a tour of the spaceship when you get it down to earth and <laughs> absolutely <Yes. laughs> do you want to join also when we finally decide to dissect the probe oh yeah yeah, yeah i'll be there i'll be there i'll be, I'm gonna be in the, I'll, be, I'll be in the bunker i'll be in the bunker on the radio you guys can dissect the probe yeah can we get filming rights for that right now before you sell it to netflix it's funny sure. when we, we have awesome. an agreement. <laughs> awesome agreement we asked avi um you know avi is going to dig up this rock from the bottom of the pacific ocean somewhere yeah. and we were we were like avi can we come and film you and he was like uh maybe uh I don't know. Uh, why don't you guys hit me up in like a couple of months? And we hit him up in a couple of months and he's like, yeah, I have a Netflix deal now. <laughs> we're like, oh, come on. Oh, you have a Netflix deal. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we good. can't compete with that. But 
Anyways, it's really cool. I'm sure if you find a probe that you will also have a Netflix deal. <laughs> and we will be in, guaranteed. I think I will not agree to a Netflix deal because I was actually supposed to have one and then I got a contract. Really? <laughs> what happened? He <laughs> said, holy shit, this I never saw. <laughs> and really? so vanished. So it was just predatory? Like the contract was just not terms that you're interested in i am still with an open mouth when i remember it wow they just wanted ownership of all the ideas i'm not well i just i didn't sign any nda so i guess i can talk about it it was a super scary deal Mm. It, it was like uh they could say anything about you fictional or true whatever and you could never sue them for defamation Mm. and it has a lot of funny things, things like that and I was like <laughs> mm. yeah you can punch Netflix all you want they're at the top of the world they're like superhero <laughs> giants you can't hurt them so <laughs> yeah, this is true. that's really interesting yeah I would... it was a very impressive deal and it was su- such a fun thing to be part of I so much wanted to join the project mm. but that contract scared the li- life out of me so <laughs> I just bailed out so what was the what was the what was it going to be about do can you share um it's it's a new ufo thing new for series mm. apparently produced i think it's produced by spielberg and so on so i was really excited about it mm. oh that must have been hard to walk away from it was so difficult and i actually changed my mind and like wanted to get back to it but then it was too late so it was <sighs> super super uh interesting and exciting and i just got cold feet <laughs> so yeah, well well you might have your second chance if you find that probe this is true <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> let's see <laughs> it's okay yeah I, I will just make sure that the probe doesn't eat me <laughs> that's important or the rest of the world the rest of the world you know, but if it eats the rest of the world, but it doesn't eat you, then you have this like primacy as sole representative to the aliens of the entire human race, and so you probably have more bargaining. I will power be very lonely at that point. I think it will be very, very lonely. Imagine the <laughs> person on the earth. It's like a Don't Look Up movie. But there was one survivor. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I um also started reading about. I was trying to figure out um something about i don't remember why i was looking for like lonely animals or i was i think i was trying to make some argument about the experience of emotions in animals and so i was trying to see if anybody was like studying that and what came up was just list after list of all of the animals where there's only one kind there's only one animal left of that kind and it was really really depressing unless i can't imagine (laughs) <laughs> super depressing all the animals that go in extinct all the time yeah alright well let's um, let's put a pin in it and see what happens down the road it seems like you uh, you probably need to get back to your work anyways it's, um, there's a lot to do <laughs> I want to keep you <laughs> thanks so much for today and sorry if I was very nervous at the beginning <laughs> no, no worries really fun. I'm, I'm glad we could assuage your fears All right, take care. Thank you so much for coming by. Have a wonderful rest of your day. See you.